All right, well, the intimate class today, so we'll kind of keep it chill, and, and if you guys got questions, let's just talk, it's all good, so. Um, but, um, yeah, so I'm John Beaton, uh, Emily, uh, again from Fairhaven Farm, and our farm's located just on uh, north of Duluth on Munger Shaw Road, um, just kind of off Highway 53 a little bit as you're heading towards the, the Iron Range. Um, and we grow uh, vegetables, so we uh, do a CSA program where we grow about an acre of vegetables. Um, and actually, we, when, we, when we bought the farm in 2017, that was the main goal. See, I started the CSA in 2014 on rented land, then I met Emily, uh, and then we found our farm in 2017, and had no intention of starting a greenhouse, but um, the woman that was growing the starter plants from the co-op uh, was kind of like scaling back. And then at that time, Emily was working here as the uh, graphic designer. And um, they said, hey, Emily, you got a farm. You guys want to grow the starts, you know? And it was absolutely insane because we're like, well, we got to. It's a great opportunity, so let's do it. But I think they said that in the, like October or something, you know? So we didn't even have a greenhouse. So we thought, oh my gosh. We went down to um, that winter, you know, in December, we went down to Minneapolis and found a used high tunnel structure and, and it was freezing, there's snow on the ground and we ripped it all apart and drug it back up here. And, and then in February, we got a really nice day. It was kind of warm day. So we snow blowed the, the footprint where that thing would go and got it all down to grass, but then it's still frozen solid. I mean, it's February, you know? So we rented a, a concrete hammer drill and bored holes into the frost so that we could place the ground post to put the, the hoop structure up. And oh man, we clobbered, kind of clobbered it together and, and made it work. But we assembled it and we had a great, you know, first season like that. And, um, and now we're in, this is season four? Six. Season six. <laughs> oh my Seven gosh. For the farm. That's right. That's right. So, but it's been great. It's been great to have the relationship uh, uh, with the co-op, and and we're kind of we're getting better every year. So, um, now we have a much bigger greenhouse. So, um, and we're also open now on Saturdays if you if you all uh, want to come visit and see the see the operation like that. So we're open on Saturdays from ten to four. So you can find more information on the website. But today we're going to talk about um, what I want to focus on really is soil health because I think that's often missed um, when people think about gardening. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how we tend our plants in the greenhouse and what makes kind of what we do special um, and a little bit different from other nurseries and other greenhouse businesses. And then we're going to conclude with uh, you guys will get to try your hand at our, well, I got a highly specialized tool that you're gonna get to use and pot up some either marigolds or tomatoes to take home, so. Um, but before I dive into it, uh, it'd be great to just hear from you and just, you know, maybe say your name and, um, you know, how many years of experience gardening you have and kind of like, what's your favorite plant to grow or like, what do you like to grow? So, you wanna start? Or what are you hoping to grow? Or what are you hoping to grow? <laughs> Sure. Yeah. yeah. I'm Wendy Gresson, and three years ago we bought a little greenhouse with home depot kit. So oh, okay. Put my eight foot. And we use it more to sit and have dinner. <laughs> dinner hey, hey, that's all right. That's awesome. Warm in there. Great. But for so I feel like I'm under eating eating plants mm. that I've done in the house. You know, buy my seeds, then I gotta share the plant. <laughs> Okay, great. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you look familiar. Yep, yep, yep. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I want to stay as organic as possible with the food sources that I see, so 
year. Great. There's always next year. Yep. Yeah. Oh yeah, with Hannah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, she's a really talented farmer. So, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. That's great. How about you? Hi, I'm Carrie Mitchell. Mm -hmm. I'm new to Duluth. My husband found a house a lot sooner than what I thought. He was buying a house here. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of just bopping back and forth. I'm originally from Fort Collins, Colorado. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm definitely curious about soil here because where I live in Colorado, it's mostly clay. Mm, well, so depends on where you are here. You might yeah. encounter the same yeah, problems, yeah. but. are all oh, theoretical yeah. but yes yeah yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so the whole soil thing would be very helpful to know sure that's great cool <laughs> how about you i think i was in the most in years i just do it because i enjoy being outside mm -hmm. being in the dirt and um i just grow mostly perennials mm -hmm. i do do tomatoes and cucumbers and some lettuce mm -hmm. Great. Cool. Okay, so where shall we start? Um, I think that, yeah, maybe I'll just say real briefly um, a just a, a little bit about how I got into it because I'm still on like a learning journey about the soil myself. Um, I didn't grow up on a farm. I grew up in the country um, and moved to Duluth uh, to go to college at UMD, and there I majored in anthropology. And so I actually came to farming and gardening and working with the plants and soil from kind of like, um, like a, from a cultural standpoint, thinking, man, this is the most human thing that I can possibly do is, is, is work with the plants and work with the soil and figure out how to grow food, you know, um, rather than being like a bi like biology oriented or whatever, you know. So, um, and so I don't have a, a like, you know, uh, biology training or, you know, I didn't study it in school, but we do plant an acre and 600 tomato plants. And over the past 10 years, I've learned a little bit. So I'll do my best to share with you uh, what I know. And so we'll start, let's start with just going over the basic uh, soil health principles. Do you have that happen? Do you happen to have that right on your phone? You got them there. But okay, so the other thing is that I am also the president of the Lake Superior Sustainable Farming Association, um, and which is, we have a local chapter here, the Lake Superior chapter, but it's also a statewide organization 
So this is an awesome place for resources for you to kind of check back on because what I'm going to refer to uh, it, it comes from the SFA, the Sustainable Farming Association, and they have five soil health principles. So, okay, the first one, and, and, and let me back up one second, because these are soil health principles and what they aim to do and what I want you to think about, instead of thinking about the soil as like just dirt or inert you know, material that you work with, I want you to think about the soil as habitat for living beings. That's the, that's the switch you have to make in your head. That's what changed my mind completely and got me away from thinking, oh, I just need fertilizer and, and that'll make it all work. Like that's part of it, but to learn how that fertilizer or anything you're applying to your beds, like how that's being used and that comes down to the soil life, the biology that's in the soil, because that is what's making the nutrients that you're introducing available to the plants. So when I go over these soil health principles, keep in mind that each one supports the biology, the health of the soil and the living creatures that are in the soil. Okay, so the first one is to keep the soil covered. Right? So if you look at nature, or you go into a forest type setting, you'll always notice that there's any available space that can grow a plant is growing a plant, right? So nature tries to keep the soil covered and that's what you should be thinking about as a gardener as well. Now that could be uh, with mulch, you know, like straw or something, but you know, you don't wanna necessarily try to keep your soil bare and open because then you're going to get you know erosion from wind and rain and things like this and and this is also helping to moderate the temperature of the soil so i'll keep coming back to these things but i'll go over them okay so keep the soil covered and the second one is to limit the disturbance right so we're at our farm trying to transition to a more of a no-till system now we are still utilizing some tillage because we're operating on a little bit bigger scale and you have to kind of, mm, that's, why, that's why this one is, uh, says limit disturbance, don't not disturb it at all because given your circumstance, you may have to. But really this is, this is kind of um, important because also the, the thing that people think of the most is like, oh, I'll just till it in, I'll till the garden, I'll till it up. And that's common practice. You till every year, or once in the spring, or once in the fall. For a little, for a little bit, you get that ideal conditions. But over time, what what will happen is, essentially, when you till the soil, you're accelerating the the breakdown of the organic material that you've introduced, um, and also you're kind of inverting the layers of the soil. So if you think about um, a tillage event. Okay, tilling your soil is the equivalent of clear cutting the forest. You start over from scratch. Now, you can do some things to accelerate that process and, and not realize the negative effects right away, but still, that's essentially what you're doing. You're taking that whole ecosystem that's built up over time uh, and kind of doing a hard reset. And that's appropriate sometimes, but you want to try to avoid doing that too much. Um, okay, so the third is... Um, building diversity and um, and this has to do with this is just kind of a general principle in nature I think diversity a diverse system is more resilient and so this is talking both about plants like the types of plants you know so think about like um, you know crop rotations you don't want to plant the same thing in the same place year after year after year but this also has to do with, um, you know, uh, well, hold on, I'm gonna hold that thought because the next one has more to do with that. But also has to do with the things that you're introducing into your, into your soil. So instead of, let's say, relying on the same kind of fertilizer or compost or manure source, like actually introducing a diversity into the system is a little bit uh, better because you're going to build up more kind of diverse population. 
Now, and I'm saying that and thinking in the back of my head and what I used to think was, and what I used to seek and search for is the, the quick fix. What's the quick fix? What's the one product or one thing that's gonna make the garden thrive? And I think that's something also that we have to kind of, kind of get over. There is no quick fix. It's all done through observation and building a relationship with the soil and a relationship with the plant. So there's no magic solution. But as you look on the internet, as you go to garden centers, you're gonna see everybody that says they have that solution. You know what I mean? We've got it here, right here. This is the perfect fertilizer, perfect mix, and they're gonna brand it at you, but 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 there's there's not there's no quick fix. So but just think then diversity of what's going into that soil and what's being planted. Okay. Now the next one is um, living roots. So keeping living roots in the soil as much as possible. Now this one's kind of neat and very, this one's very complex. So now what we're practicing at here at, at our farm um, and the way that we're trying to incorporate that concept is through cover crops. So in between the plants that we want to grow, like our tomatoes and cucumbers, etc., like what we plant in between those, like in terms of successions, uh, which we haven't implemented perfectly but are getting closer to, is cover crops. So selecting certain plants that have kind of certain characteristics, and again, this feeds into that diversity concept, right? So, uh, so if the goal is to keep a living root in the soil as much as possible, like, okay, for example, we'll plant tomatoes, okay, we'll... Well, when those are done, maybe we'll plant oats and peas. This is a common cover crop mix, oats and peas, because oats and peas will winter kill, which means the frost will completely terminate them. They won't turn into a weed that will come back next year. And so with things like uh, peas or anything in the legume family, these are unique plants because they can actually fix nitrogen in the soil have a symbiotic relationship with the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil that causes them to um, essentially pull nitrogen from the atmosphere because there's nitrogen everywhere and pull it through the plant and that relationship with the fungus will allow that nitrogen to kind of solidify into little kind of nodules that attach themselves to the roots. So you think about it that way then um, then those legumes are are fixing nitrogen in their roots and then when they die that plant decomposes and makes that nitrogen available to the the biology and thus the next plants that you plant in that same space um, or let's see another example if you're in different if you're in a different kind of scale or if you're operating in a raised bed, see I don't operate in raised beds, but I'm trying to think of ways to incorporate that same concept. Like maybe, maybe allowing a little bit of clover to exist in your bed without weeding it completely because a clover is a, le a legume as well, which will also fix nitrogen, has a beneficial um, or a symbiotic relationship with uh, a fungus primarily, a fungal relationship. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that and you just, think to yourself or feel free to ask questions too. What about X, Y, and Z? But keeping living roots in the soil, that's important. And like you said, if you're over tilling, you're disrupting all of that. Ex that exactly, yep. And is it true that also, you know, admitting the carbon, that that's also another reason why not to? Yeah, on a really large scale, absolutely. When, when, when farms, um, till or plow, I mean, you're talking thousands and thousands of acres. Yeah, you're taking the carbon, which is essentially organic material. We're made out of carbon, the trees are made out of carbon, everything's made out of carbon. So the soil, that is the food source for the soil. It's like when we eat a tomato, well, the soil eats carbon. And so when you till that, plow that, whatever, you're, you're, you're kind of, um, either accelerating the digestion of that carbon or it's oxidizing and it's just kind of losing it. You're losing it to the atmosphere. So on a big scale, yes, that's important. Right, right. 
Okay, so we got living roots. This one might be slightly difficult for you all on home scale, but maybe not. And this is, um, and this is unique to the SFA's stance on soil health. And this is integrating livestock. So, and there's ways to do it literally with live creatures or incorporating, you know, their composted manures. And the livestock are really important because they're kind of the, the thing that is completing the, the nutrient cycle, right? The grass is growing, they're harvesting that material, digesting it, and making those nutrients available to the plants then. But also actually having the animals interact with the soil is beneficial as well. So like as a cow or chicken, whatever walks over the pasture, they're taking their hooves and when they walk on the grass, they're pushing a little bit into the ground. Well, now that's kind of available for that biology to start decomposing and digesting, which is super cool. Or chickens, I mean, chickens will do the same thing. They'll peck at the grass, they'll scratch, they'll kick things up, and then they'll leave their manure behind, which so, so really the, the livestock component is super cool. And that's what we're trying to incorporate at our farm too. We, we're, um, um, gonna get a flock of sheep this fall kind of for that purpose so that we can plant a cover crop in our field right these grasses and legumes this diverse cover crop and then have the sheep graze that you know what I mean so we're getting kind of we're stacking the benefits like that um, and yeah so in integrating livestock and then one kind of thing that kind of is the overarching theme of all of those things, then is like your own context. Like I said before, you, you, there's no silver bullet or perfect solution. You have to take those, observe your plot, your space, and kind of do the best you can to incorporate them, you know, uh, in, in a way that's relevant to your situation. So um, now, what is all of that doing then? And why is that all important? And the best way to think about it, I think, is that there's actually life in the soil, right? When you walk into the forest and you see the different critters, you see a deer, you see ducks, you know, you see, you can physically see all of the things in the forest. There's just as much, if not more, diversity in the soil. In like a teaspoon of soil, there's a billion microbes and fungus and, and, uh, uh, and small insects and, and all of these things up to the higher levels until you get to like, like worms that you can actually see. So you can see some, but 99% you cannot see. But it's important to understand what they're doing and that there's kind of a... Just like the ocean, there's kind of like a chain of succession. You start with fungus and bacteria. Those things, the main goal of those things is to break down the carbon, break down the carbon material. So any type of, of, of grass or any type of plant material. So another way to think about that is to say that in one acre, a field, you have the equivalent of an elephant that you are feeding, right? Like you can't totally see it, but that is literally digesting the carbon material in that acre. So as you think about what do I put in my garden? What do I do to my garden? That's what you're thinking about. Like you can feed hay to a sheep and you get that, but it's the same concept with your field incorporating carbon material uh, to feed the soil. Um, so in other words, it's a, something that is, or you'll see people talking or hear people talking about organic matter, organic material, and that's literally what they're talking about is the plant parts that break down and then feed the microbes. Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. Right. It's also very similar to how your own digestive system works in that when you eat food, 
you don't just, it doesn't just dissolve in your body and then you get the nutrients. That food is actually being consumed by the biology in your gut. And its waste product is the nutrients that your body then uptakes. So the same thing in the soil. When, that, when the biology breaks down the carbon material, you know, if you think about it, like a plant, okay, a plant planted in the soil, um, it's uptaking nutrients. Okay, so this is full of nutrients that previously existed in the soil. So if I uprooted that plant, I would be holding kind of nutrients, uh, minerals that are, were present in the soil. So if I take that plant and squish it back into the soil, you're kind of returning that you're returning the nutrients and the minerals back to the soil. So, um, and then as that biology breaks that down, it is its waste product that then makes those nutrients available for the plants to uptake, if that makes sense. And now you talk about living roots in the soil, it gets even more complicated because the roots are actually attracting the biology because the roots have something that, and all plants have this, something called uh, exudates. So they actually exude different compounds that attract the biology to the plant. And you have this other special type of um, fungus called mycorrhizal. Maybe you've seen that, heard that, mycorrhizal fungi. So this is a particular, actually there's hundreds of different types, but they're all in the same kind of category, um, that form a symbiotic relationship with plants. So, so for our tomato plants, for example, uh, and in fact all of our plants that we grow in our greenhouse, um, our soil is inoculated with this mycorrhizal fungi. So when you plant that plant in the ground, then you're placing that into your garden as well. And so what that does is it kind of creates this relationship with the roots. And the fungus and the plant, which are completely two unrelated things, but when they work together, they literally communicate with each other. And as the fungus expands, Again, you can't see this. You can see kind of a little bit of it if you look close, but what it's doing, the fungus is breaking, helping to break down that organic material and making those nutrients available to the plant. It's so you can think about it like, um, like if the root mass of the tomato is this big, by having that mycorrhizal association, the root mass is actually this big because they're literally kind of growing and extending the root system of the different plants. So, um, pulling nutrients that might not otherwise be available to that plant's root system from another location. And yeah, so that's when the and water. Alive and growing. Yep, yep. So, and that's in a healthy ecosystem that has those relationships right there. So like right. that would be another reason not to then disturb the soil repeatedly because each time you're doing that, you would be breaking up those networks of mycorrhizae and like so breaking up those root systems. Once that plant's harvested, mm -hmm. it'll leave it. <laughs> right. Because I see where it's at. Yeah. It never, never, it never hurt me. Yeah, no, right. <laughs> I mean, it depends on the plant, right? Um, what we're trying to do and what I've noticed when we work our fields is if there's any, you know, um, like um, your dahlias, okay? She left some dahlias in the field and in the fall and we were prepping the beds to plant them in the spring. And as we were... I wanted and then I left some others that I couldn't, I couldn't save them all. So right. they're root, living root system in right. the ground. Um, and so by not let's say let's say you get to the end of the season and you and and you want to just get a clean slate and you rip everything out of your bed including the roots well now that biology has no food source or over the winter and early on in spring so when we were prepping that bed with those dahlias 
um, you know, you, you would pull up hundreds of worms. They're all attached. They're eating the dahlia bulbs. But in a space where those weren't, there wasn't much activity. So by keeping the roots in the soil, even if you harvest the plant and keep that roots in there, for sure, that is adding um, uh, material into the soil. Even, even the, another benefit of like a cover crop, or really this can apply to any plants that are planted there, when those plants drive their roots down deep into the soil, well, and now that plant, let's say you, you harvest it, well, now those roots are, will decay. Well, and as those get consumed, now you have little pathways down into the soil where your water and nutrients and air, oxygen, can kind of infiltrate deeper into the soil. So, so yes, absolutely. Keeping the, even after the plants harvest, keep the roots into the, you know, in the soil like that. I think I feel like I always thought, well, it's a new plant, you need to make space for it. Right. It's totally disturbed. Right. It's, um, <laughs> it's kind of getting and accepting the messiness of it all. Yeah. It's not neat, perfect. It's and not a laboratory. Plenty of room for the new roots. Exactly. Right. And that goes back to that context piece too, because you may not have the kind of amount of space to do that. Like if you're doing quicker successions of things, or just depending on the size of the roots, like it might make sense mm -hmm. to keep it there because of what you might be planting next. Mm -hmm. You kind of have to think about the whole system together and if that's going to work for you. Because some, some things we do take out and some things we don't. Right. You know? Right. Um, some stems take up longer. Right. Others break down quicker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to pause for a second if anybody else has other questions or comments, concerns. Yeah. Do you think as many rays, because we have four rays bins, would you put a little oat seeds at the end of the unit? Uh, oat rays? seeds? Yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah, I mean, oh, certainly, yeah. I mean, I think in a, in a raised bed, you've got an excellent opportunity to, to, to lay down some cover crop. If you'd want to plant oats and peas or any kind of diverse mix, if you, got, if you have like old seeds that you want to use up, throw it in there in a diverse mix. The more diversity, truly the better, because each plant has a different characteristic. Some are deep-rooted, some are shallow-rooted, some are legumes and can fix nitrogen, some are not. Um, Each root system has like different attributes that attract different biology to your mm -hmm, system too. So mm -hmm. you're getting diversity not only with the plants, but then with the biology that that right. attracts. Right. Right. And then, you know, in a raised bed setting, it'd be it'd be like, and you want to get some growth on the plant too. You know, so you would plant if you did a cover crop. You know, you could probably get away with planting something in, let's say, September or something. Before, you know, a, I know we can get a frost, but if you're in Duluth, maybe you could get a, you know, three, four weeks of growth on the on the plants before uh, a frost would terminate them or kill them like that. But then does that mean come May June they're leaving it up more and turning it over? Well, not really. So see, because plant, you'd you'd plant right into that material. See, because after the winter and the snow is on it and whatever all that stuff's going to pack down it's just going to it's just going to be kind of material right on the surface and your inclination it, your inclination is to clear all of that material away but actually it's more beneficial you can lightly fork it in or work it in but um, you don't necessarily have to start from a clean slate every time um, that's why we choose things that are kind of like a winter kill cover crop because yeah, you, would, you wouldn't want to plant something that'll come back, then it turns into a weed, but. Right. Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah, I think that's great. Thank you. Like <laughs> overwintering? Yeah. Um, well, we have kind of a. Mm. Um, and then the yeah, yeah, yeah. 
hmm, it might be a it might be a challenge in a raised bed because now you're actually above the surface. You know what I mean? Where if, if you're completely in the ground, you'll ha you'll have the temperature or the earth itself to, to regulate that temperature. So it might be more challenging. I mean, you could put some it. straw bales around it and mulch it super heavy, and maybe that would that would help. Um, you yeah, know. Oh yeah, lots of different hardy herbs. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had uh, we planted carrots and didn't harvest some of them last fall that overwintered, and we were eating carrots. You know, uh, first first as soon as the snow, as soon as, as, soon as the ground thawed. So, um, but. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So look at complaints. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um yeah, we can look at some plants. And we can talk a little bit about what we do in our greenhouse and, and kind of what makes or how we're incorporating what we were just talking about into our greenhouse operation. So I think to do that, it's also important to understand what uh, the typical or kind of like industry standard is for a greenhouse or a nursery. And um, now there are exceptions, um, but however, most greenhouses will um, just kind of order in plants from other even bigger greenhouses, wholesale greenhouses, right? They'll order in plugs or smaller plants. You know, they'll order in a plant that comes that's that big and they do it at the greenhouses. They pot it up into a bigger pot or put it in a hanging basket or whatever. Um, and we thought about that early on, but what we struggled with was the transparency. You know, like we just didn't know where these plants were coming from. Oftentimes they're very um, uh, chemical intensive operations because if you're growing, you know, 10 million tomatoes in the same spot, you tend to have disease and different things build up. So they're sprayed with chemicals and things like that. And there's no way to be kind of sure of, of what we're delivering to people. So we've made a commitment at our farm to grow everything from seed or now as we have been there for a while, we're, we're building up a stock of our own uh, perennials and taking divisions or cuttings from these things, um, which, is, which is really cool. Um, and last year, we also switched to our peat pots, which have been awesome. We're trying to use less plastic. Um, and these pots are cool because you can actually see the roots coming out the bottom. And what that's doing then is as that comes out, it'll it'll hit the air and will air prune. So the roots will just kind of die back until it gets into the pot. So now you'll have like this vigorous root growth because as the air prunes, the plant then says, well, I gotta grow more roots, I gotta grow more roots. As opposed to being a plastic pot that would just get root bound and, and packed in there like that. Um, and we also have made a commitment to shy away from uh, uh, fossil fuels at our farm. So we heat our greenhouse with a wood-fired boiler, which every other greenhouse operator would say we are absolutely insane by, <laughs> to do that because it's way harder and more work. Um, but we also are surrounded by forests and have access to wood. So we, we heat our greenhouse with a wood-fired boiler, which is kind of cool. So did you have a question? Yeah, one thing I came across like three years ago was Ah, yes. So it's like I want a bigger pot for the tomato plants. And the person down in our street has a yard bucket and has heirloom ones just lined up in mm -hmm. yard buckets. But these cloth bags, they're movable and that, and I feel like that's a little better. Yeah, absolutely, yep. In fact, if you come visit us at our greenhouse, we have uh, seven-gallon grow bags. And it's made of that same, like a cloth type material. It's a recycled, um, uh, some kind of synthetic material, but it's recycled and lasts a while. And it does the same thing. It allows the roots to go outside the bag and kind of air prune um, and keep growing. So, uh, we, and we use those, actually we have 
all kinds of stuff grown in those bags right now. We got lettuce and bok choy and mustard greens and um, and big tomatoes. We'll, we'll grow some tomatoes too. We're using that as sort of like our early um, plots because we can't get them to the ground early, mm -hmm. so we keep these grow bags in the greenhouse and we can have an earlier harvest. Mm -hmm. And we're also using them to um, kind of keep those perennials going. So like we have some mint and some lemon balm, and we'll then next spring be able to take division from those mother plants. Mm-hmm. Move them in and out of Are there other materials for growing that we have like these things to be grown? For um, because like I just had a garden that was like two blocks of these. Mm. Sure about I'm, I'm finding a lot of things on like the balcony you know, Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. Which I, I did the damage last year and I was like, oh, you guys Yeah, I know. mean maybe that would build up toxicity probably over time, but yeah, galvanized stuff or sometimes people grow stuff in tires, that's kinda questionable. <laughs> I don't know, you know. Um I'm I'm not sure. I mean the only thing that comes to mind in terms of like being food safe is, you know, you you don't want to use like super fresh manure or things like this, you know, uh, you want to make sure it's kind of composted, either buy it composted or compost it yourself. Um, hmm. But are you, are you thinking now just the kind of actual aggregate in your box or like the fertilizer or both? Or what do you, or, or, like or, okay, okay, okay. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, a lot of what, right, a lot of what this is, yeah, is, is the mycorrhizal fungi, actually, because our mix has that in there, so that's trying to digest the pot. <laughs> right. Right. I wouldn't eat the pot, but, I mean, I don't think there's a danger of it, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you can be... Kind of creative, but like you say, maybe the galvanized stuff wouldn't be the best. But um, um, but I think most material is, is is fine, you know. So especially because it's not like direct contact with the food you're eating. It's the actual right. Uh -huh. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have any other questions or anything? Where, what's next here, lovely? Well, we were going to share oh, our... Oh, wait, problems. he's got one. If you are working with, let's say, a, well, say, a new plot of land or a piece of land that has been logged for however many years, and you are hoping to do like a lasagna-style garden, mm -hmm. I'm going to say pumpkins, because it's to the mound, mm -hmm. how deep would you recommend going for the soil for the mound to have that? Hmm. Prepping like a new spot. Mm-hmm. That helps. Yep. And then do a mound on top of that without tilling. Mm-hmm. But how deep would you need to go? Because in, it, it is clay. It's all clay. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, you know, it kind of depends, again, on context. I mean, so I'll explain just how we open up new fields and then try to relate it back to your lasagna garden thing. Because we have used cardboard to smother weeds like that before. Um, Without having to even remove the, the sod to use the 
Right, right. A longer process, but. Um, yeah, and it depends on your timeline too. So, but, so when we when we open up a new space or we want to uh, 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 prep a space for planting, what we'll do is lay down um, a piece of black plastic, and let that sit for one whole year to completely terminate the sod underneath, um, and kill the perennial weeds. Again, those weeds then become food for the soil, which is good. You can't leave it on for two, three years. Now you're starting to do damage to the biology probably, but um, one year you're going to terminate that sod or whatever grass is growing there. Um, and then what I would do is, um, you know, loosen that soil with some kind of fork. We use this big broad fork, which is pretty heavy duty, um, uh, but we'll loosen that soil and you know, um, depends in, depending on what you want to grow, it might be beneficial to do some kind of soil test if you're super concerned about the things you're growing and, and what you want to achieve because like these techniques that I'm describing, um, they're fairly forgiving, but if you do have very specific goals and you want to kind of bring your soil into balance, there is no substitute for a soil test. Like you should get your soil tested and figure out what am I lacking so you're not adding too much of one thing or not enough of another, you know. This is um, a space that we're being challenged at now because this, the field that we've been working for several years now, um, you kind of get a little grace period early on. First time you plant, well, it's hey, it's perfect because it's fresh and you've got all that activity but if you keep taking from it, taking from it, and taking from it, and not giving back, it's going to slowly start to um, kind of degrade that soil, you know, and you'll you'll see that in your plants. That's where that kind of like observation piece is important, or like literally building that relationship with your soil and with your plants, mm -hmm. observing them, seeing what's happening, and then understanding what you're doing too. Like if you're taking something, it's a good idea to get it, get something. So that's kind of what, how we think about it. Like, as we're taking, we're always wanting to give as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, so then if you were if you were going to add some material into that, I mean, what I would target is like a composted cow manure or some kind of manure source, um, and kind of blend the two slightly. You know, um, now if you're growing pumpkins, see that lasagna thing, it's kind of tough because in just one season, you put that cardboard down and that cardboard is not going to break down that much. See, we tried that um, last year, a couple of years ago, and it was like we planted, we put down that much soil on top, but then that's all the soil you have, period. So the, now the pumpkin or whatever we planted there is hitting the cardboard and, and, and not able to grow too. So. I think for establishing plots or doing this lasagna type uh, uh, um, uh, kind of gardening, like time is an important ingredient to the whole mix. You know, you got to let it all incorporate and you got to let it all kind of terminate the sod underneath um, and let stuff start breaking down before you're going to find success like that. Another kind of like um, thing to think about is like with your plant, the foliage on top is kind of a mirror of what's underneath the soil. So like the, the a root system of this size plant would be similar to the size of this foliage. Right. So as the plant grows, that's going to get different too. Um, so we think about like squash or pumpkin. Right. Yeah, it those has, are very big. Right. So they're going to be doing a lot of like reaching. Their roots are going to reach. Um, mm -hmm. They don't really Mm -hmm. Good amount of soil on top of that for that, like, that kind of relaxity. 
Mm-hmm. Right. And so with the plastic method, like, is there a better time to start that? Well, because we live in a cold place, like, as soon as possible <laughs> in the springtime. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. And it depends on the types of, you know, that the plastic is primarily to terminate the perennial weeds right. or grass or whatever you're dealing with. So it depends on what it is. You could till it if it's not a noxious weed that's going to come back and back and back. What we deal with at the farm, the primary weed that we deal with is quack grass, which forms these long spaghetti-like rhizomes and you chop it into 10. Well, now you've got 10 plants. So uh, we that's why we found success with the tarping because it kills that quack grass. But it takes a whole year to do it, but it does it. Now, if you want to, you got a spot and you want to till it as a one-time event just to break that sod, you know, that's fine. You know, like I said, it's all about kind of context. Then you can start practicing the, the minimal disturbance after that, but at the end of the day, you have to create the space, you know, for it like that, so. in like a smaller space I think you know because if you're planting that whole box that whole thing will be covered in roots so that nutrient would be available to it uh, kind of wherever it is in the box but um, hmm, I, w I mean my gut says I would incorporate it you know like mix it in that that deep you know um, and kind of uniformly throughout. I'd mix it in a little bit. I mean, especially if you're get, if you're starting with a, a transplant that already has some roots. Like if you put it on the top, it's going to be a while before those yeah, nutrients get right. down to those roots. So you want to have it where those roots can access. And right. Can access those right. You can always put it on top, but then. You're just, it takes longer. Exactly. Yep. It's more time. So is there a ratio with a raised bed? Do you have smaller, like, you know, okay, I've got this much soil, dirt, mm -hmm. the compost. Yeah, you know, this, yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, that's, um, it's a challenge because yeah, the, the, when you have a bed, it's kind of like, like a raised bed like that. It's kind of good, but it's also kind of bad because you have absolute control. Now you have to start making those decisions. Whereas the soil, you kind of got what you got, you know, for the raised bed, you know, it doesn't have to be a ton of compost because the compost primarily for the, it has very relatively little nutrient content. Like it's more for the biology, that compost. You know, if it was me, I would put some form of, if you're literally starting from scratch, I'd put some form of carbon down on the bottom to give you some kind of loft, like straw or something just to give you some loft so you're not putting soil from the absolute bottom to the absolute top. It's gonna compact a little bit, you know? Um, and then it kind of depends on the, the sources you have available to you, um, you know, or leaf mold, like leaves. If you have leaves to incorporate in that as much as you can too, I think that'd be helpful. See, they sell like kind of like garden mix or black dirt at garden centers. The problem I have with that stuff is you just don't know what you're getting, you know, you don't know what it is. Oftentimes it's, you know, 
something that's just been like the topsoil they scraped off and put in a pile and it's you know not and they mix it with some sand or something so um and oftentimes it's really dense i find but yeah that's more like an inert material so you'll have to still add in some nutrients and right. some carbon to break for the plants so. like when we think about our potting mix we think in um, th in thirds, so you want one third perlite, one third peat moss, one third compost. So if you think about what those things are doing in that mix, think to yourself, what materials could I s kind of recreate that in a raised bed? You know, something that's going to give it um, some absorbency. Like you can even buy bales of peat moss from Menards or peat is basically peat. There's only a couple sources in the whole world it comes from. So, um, you know, a perlite. Now, I wouldn't dump that in your raised bed necessarily, but that's the white, you know, kind of little, little white pebble kind of popcorn things. I would. No, that's just that's just literally to kind of give the mix loft and space. So think about, when you think about that perlite, think about that as like your chopped straw. That is your kind of like, mm, like air yeah. Has some better drainage so that your soil's not getting compacted. Right, yep, yep, yep. Um, yeah, you it know. Also be the, the, the wood chips on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, on the bottom, not towards the top, because the chips take a long time to break down. Wood, wood chips you don't want to incorporate as a top mulch if you're growing like vegetables and things because and not adding extra fertility to make up for that that wood chip as that breaks down it ties up the nitrogen that's in the soil because of the biology that's trying to break down that you know if you think about a wood chip it's like that's a big piece of material to, to break down as compared to like grass for example you know so it, it can tie up nitrogen. Now, if you're planting just perennials, um, and that's not totally a concern, you know, you, people will mulch with like wood chips like that to smother weeds and things like that. But, um, yeah. And so I think if, if you're starting from scratch, building raised beds, you know, I would lean towards, you know, peat. And, you know, maybe you can find some kind of soil mix, whether it comes in bags or maybe it's just a small amount of this kind of like garden soil that you would find in a, a garden center. But don't, don't rely completely on that for all of your nutrients, all of your whatever. It's not just, like I said, no quick fix. So maybe, it, maybe it's a little bit of uh, wood chips or straw on the bottom, then you build a layer of that, that kind of uh, garden mix material. Maybe you incorporate a little bit of peat so it's more, mm, better texture. Um, Another awesome product is um, worm casting. You can find that in different uh, garden centers. Um, and that's really useful, again, primarily for the biology. That worm casting is some of the best um, um, uh, stuff for enlivening the biology like that. Um, and you know, if you're keeping it simple, you just got a raised bed. Another product that we really like um, that we incorporate into the our field is uh, composted chicken manure. You can find that at garden centers. There's different brands called like Coop Poop. You know what I mean? This is just like a kind of general all purpose, slow release fertilizer and you don't need that much. If you're only in a four by eight raised bed, you don't need, you'd need a, you know, maybe a pound of that. You know, it doesn't, it, a little bit goes a long ways. Um, but, but I would challenge you to experiment. <laughs> Find what you get, you know, use what you got. The whole thing's an experiment. Yeah. Right. Right. Yep. And then also thinking about your context, what is available to you, right? Maybe you live near, no, we live right next to the um, Northeast Correctional Facility, and they grow hay and straw. Hey. Hey. Um, yep. So we're going to be using some of that in our system because mm -hmm. it's available to us. And yeah. 
what we're going to do is take hay bales um, and, <clears throat> and set them out and let them rot down over the summer and break them down and then in the fall kind of break it up and apply it to our beds as a way to introduce a ton of organic material all at once. So it's kind of like an alternative to growing your own, like a growing a cover crop. It's essentially the same thing. Um, um, and, you know, kind of letting that go through the winter like that. So we're adding that material like that. So if you're thinking about that raised bed, that's what you should be thinking is, is what can I incorporate in there for the soil to eat? Because it's even more of a challenge when you're in a raised bed situation because, again, you have complete control. The earth and the soil that's naturally present will be able to buffer back and forth and it can figure its thing out, but you got to figure out the bed. That's the challenge, you know, so. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, yep. Liquid stuff is, is good. <clears throat> um, the liquid fertilizer is more readily available. Like the plants can uptake it faster. Whereas like the, the, <clears throat> the organic material, you know, the grass and stuff, Thanks. that for the nutrients to be available from that, the biology has to break it down. Well, in a liquid form, it's like way more readily accessible to the plants. So the strategy I would adopt is to say, let's apply some granular fertilizer like this chicken manure. And that's your long term. That's, your, that's gonna last you most of the season. And then your liquid fertilizers are gonna kind of like, you know, maybe you plant your plants and apply just a little bit of liquid fertilizer just to kind of give them a, a, a boost right away or periodically add a small amount over time rather than thinking that that liquid is going to be, um, it's not gonna last very long. You know, the plants will take what they can take and then the rest just gets washed out. Um, Yeah. Kind of just to give a little boost. We have a, a guy that works for us that's very passionate about all this kind of stuff and has developed some um, kiwi recipes using um, some of that uh, slurry loose chicken manure and then some worm castings and then he's got a you know, bubbler system that aerates the water. The water overnight and then applies it afterwards. So that's mm-hmm. kind of just taking all that stuff from those sources and making it more available readily. Mm-hmm. Cause again, if you go to the, you go to the store and you can find a million of these different types of liquid fertilizer, right? Again, all saying, Hey, we got the solution. When in reality, if you had good compost and you submerge that in water and stir it a few times a day for a couple days, you're going to extract the nutrients from that good compost or even that coop poop, that chicken manure, that I think it's like a tablespoon or a couple tablespoons in a gallon of water. Now you're gonna get not the complete profile, but you're going to extract the water soluble nutrients um, um, from that fertilizer. So yeah, yeah. So liquid's just more readily accessible like that. The miracle Grow, unless it's organic, I would, couldn't suggest it because now here's the problem with the synthetic. Now, as people thought, hey, we can develop these liquid fertilizers and they're really great. Um, but if they come from a synthetic source, so um, the primary uh, uh, source for, for these liquid fertilizers are ammonia. And this is a byproduct of the petroleum industry, right? So what that does is actually kills the soil biology. Okay, so you're gonna get a shot to your plant and it's gonna, wow, it's so green, look at it, it's really great. But what you're doing is like destroying the long-term health of the soil. This is a problem in big agriculture right now too, you know, because it works, but only so long as you keep adding that chemical like that. So there are some liquid fertilizers that um, um, should, in my opinion, be avoided. Um, Primarily things that are synthetic based like that. And if it's, if it's organic, uh, generally you, you can assume that it's from a natural source. So err on the side of caution with the liquid stuff, I guess. That's my suggestion. 
You guys want to plant some plants or what? Sure. All right, let's do it. OK, so we got a selection here. And this is going to help you understand how, again, we do stuff in the greenhouse. So we've got a couple trays. Maybe what we can do is, can we just like move a couple of these chairs so we can um, kind of get at? Maybe we just work on this one spot. All right, we got a couple different options here for you. And these will you'll get to take home. So we either have marigolds or we've got several different types of tomatoes. We got a Cherokee purple, black cream, and a brandy wine on this flat. And uh, what do we got? Sun, sun gold in there. So first thing you'll want is, again, your highly specialized right. farm tool. No, I do. <laughs> fondue fork. We find at Savers for like 25 cents a piece, which is awesome, but they're very handy. So all we're going to do is, you know, we can pick a pot um, and you're going to find your little plant here. Now, this is what we do when we start plants. We always seed into an open flat like this in rows. Now, you would never grow that many tomatoes probably at home, but we do. So we have a lot of them. But same concept. We're going to go kind of from underneath the plant, pick them out, and then just be real gentle as you kind of like separate the roots. Now, what's cool about the tomato plant is as deep as you plant this thing, when the tissue comes in contact with the soil, it will tell it to be roots. So if I plant it up to here, now my root mass will form from here downward. So we want to actually get a nice big hole like that. And we'll go deep like that. Tuck them in just like that. Easy peasy. Now you just got to do that. How many tomatoes do you think we grow? 6,000 probably? <laughs> do it that many more times so we can kind of spread out wherever you think and the same thing this is marigolds these guys are packed in here they're super thick but um, um, and they're and the roots are they're pretty resilient so you can just kind of rip them apart and take them and just... oh gosh yes yes this is a one-time shot to yeah. pretend you're in a greenhouse so pot up some tomatoes pot up some marigolds tomatoes, yep what do we got over here? Cherokee Start from the side. Purple. Cherokee purple. Okay, so that's a big slicer. It's heirloom, really nice. Kind of has uh, purple flesh and uh, purple interior. Ooh. Cherokee purple. Okay. What's the next one? Black crim. Black crim. Very similar, also kind of dark, um, uh, but another big slicer. Um, and brandy wine. Brandy wine is that awesome. Familiar. That one is. Kind of like the quintessential heirloom slicer tomato. Yeah, think you can't find it anywhere in stores because they bruise really easily. So they don't ship, you gotcha. can't find them anywhere. But that will produce a giant, giant tomato if you get it to work really well. Right. So, um, And then we've got our Italian heirloom, um, Italian heirloom, which is kind of a knotty, knobby, weird looking one, but is used for paste and sauces and stuff, that one's really awesome. And then the sun gold, which is everybody's favorite. This is a little yellow uh, cherry, cherry tomato. tomato. Yep, okay, gotcha. yep, yep, so. So do we have any um, like um, way to mark these plants? We should have brought some tags. You think you, you, think you got a pen and a something or because um, you guys can, if you want to take three, four tomatoes, that's fine. I'd say go for it. Let's we because we weren't sure how many people are going to be in the class. We have plenty of pots. These are all our extras. So if you want to just um, yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Take some. T yeah, Italian heirlooms. Oh man. Yep. Yep. Yeah, set the roots in like that. Yeah. Think about as you're selecting which ones to put in the pots. Um, oftentimes, we plant like this. Things will be really close together, and you might get a little. A couple little weird little guys like, like that. Sure. That and one's just kind of not worth it. Very little room on that plant. So this is going to be an instance where I would uh, give 
So you're looking for like the root um, that are a little bit more intact, bigger root system, that's going to give you your stronger plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's great. Now this this potty mix we use is uh, Pro Mix. So we, we buy that at Dan's Feed Bin. Super awesome stuff. Um, and that comes inoculated with this mycorrhizal fungi. So that's really awesome, especially with the tomatoes, because they do form a, a, a relationship with the tomatoes like that. A couple things that don't do that, the brassica family, they, it's like only a few plant types in the, uh, in the world that don't form that mycorrhizal relationship, but the brassicas are one. So like cabbages, Brussels sprouts, kale, all of that kind of stuff. So in fact, brassicas are kind of antifungal. So if you have fungus issues in your soil, you plant brassicas to kind of break that fungal cycle. So for instance, we just planted a brassica mix as a cover crop where we are now gonna be planting our tomatoes in our high summer. Because right. Because we don't want to have the tomato fungus is built up in that space. Right, right. And what added. Oh yeah, there's fungus everywhere. 